Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the annual Drama Therapy Research Symposium organized by the Theater and Health Lab at NYU Program in Drama Therapy. My name is Danielle. I'm a second year graduate student at the NYU Drama Therapy Program. Um, the facilitators for this session uh, are going to be covering um, the issue of drama therapy with incarcerated, criminalized, and justice impacted populations issue of drama therapy review. We have Kamran Afari, PhD, RDT, and is an associate professor of communication studies at Cal State LA. He is the author of Performance and Activism, Grassroots Discourse After the Los Angeles Rebellion of 1992, and co-author of a chapter on NARA drama and current approaches in drama therapy. Um, we have Shabria Alston, LCAT, LMHC, RDT, who is an alumni of Lesley University, currently working in private practice. She's an independent researcher working on a few different articles. Uh, Lynn Baker Nauman, MA, LF, LMFT, and RDT, has a private practice and graduated from CIIS. She is, an, she is an adjunct professor, excuse me, of social work and human services at Folsom Lake College, Rising Scholars and Rising Scholars Prep Pre-Prison Reentry Education Program. Barbara A. Bornman, MA, RDT, BCT, and LCAT is a licensed creative arts therapist, drama therapist, master's level forensic psychologist and researcher who works in Correctional Health Services, New York, New York. Former work includes clinical leadership and program development at AHRC, Elmhurst Hospital, Interfaith Medical Center, and Kings County Hospital, New York, New York. Zena Dakash is the founder and director of Catharsis Lebanese Center for Drama Therapy. She has directed plays and films for advocacy, awareness raising, and legal forms, including 12 Angry Lebanese, Sheher Azad's Diary, and The Blue Inmates, and is the recipient of many awards for distinguished contributions in the field. Soraya Keating, MA, has facilitated mindfulness-based uh, expressive arts and drama therapy practices with marginalized populations, including at-risk youth, adults with developmental disabilities, prison inmates, and others for more than 20 years. She has taught at Santa Rosa Junior College, JFKI University, and is an adjunct professor at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Elizabeth Malone Altit, MFA, RDT, works with people impacted by incarceration, most recently facilitating therapeutic theater workshops with incarcerated youth with Project Kinship. She is also an adjunct instructor with the Drama Therapy Institute of LA. Christine Mayer, PhD, RDT, is Assistant Professor, Faculty of Social Work at University of Manitoba. She is Associate Editor of Drama Therapy Review. Mallory Minerson, MA, RDT, CCC, CDWF, LPN. Mallory is an NYU graduate of the Drama Therapy Program and now works as the Regional Clinical Supervisor of Child and Youth Counselors, Addictions and Mental Health in the Beaufort Delta region of the Northwest Territories in Canada. She is currently working towards her PhD in psychiatry through the University of Alberta. Nisha Sajnani, PhD RDT BCT is the director of the program in drama therapy and theater and health lab. She is principal editor of Drama Therapy Review. Jonathan Shaler is professor of communication and director of the certificate program in conflict analysis and resolution at the University of Wisconsin Parkside. He is also the founder and director of the Shakespeare Prison Project in partnership with the Wisconsin Department of Corrections. His publications include Performing New Lines, Prison Theater. Marianne Schein, MA, LMFT, RDT, has a private practice and is a teaching artist at San Quentin Prison through Marin Shakespeare Company. She received her master's from CIIS, is certi certified in EMDR and Hakomi, and loves improv. Rowena Tam is a drama therapist, artist, and PhD student at Concordia University. She is a guest living and working in Montreal. Angel Cook, PhD, RDT, BCT, is a drama therapist who runs her own private practice. Dr. Cook is an associate professor at Lesley University and in the fall will adjunct at NYU and Antioch in their drama therapy departments. She is the managing editor for the Drama Therapy Review. 
With the NADTA, Angel has served as conference chair and on the research committee for the past two years. She holds a master's in theater education from Emerson College and completed her drama therapy coursework through the alternative track program. Angel earned her PhD in expressive arts therapy from Lesley University. Now, without further ado, I will pass the torch to Kamran. Thank you so much, Danielle. Great to be here today. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, we have a really incredible uh, presentation today of panelists. You just heard, I mean, the, the, just the bios. You, you, you listen to this, you're quite a few of us. Um, today's session is really a presentation of issue 8.1 of Drama Therapy Review, which was titled Drama Therapy with Incarcerated criminalized and justice impacted populations. We have a tremendously rich program for you. There's a lot of pre-recorded uh, presentations that I will be uh, playing for you, uh, quite a few actually. And then there's several of us who are here live present, several of us who, are, who have pre-recorded messages, but also will be here live with you as well too. Briefly, I just want to say as a, I was a guest editor, guest co-editor along with Elizabeth Malone Altit of Issue Drama Therapy Review issue number 8.1. I'm really grateful and honored for this unique opportunity to, uh, to be a guest editor, to work with several authors and the peer reviewers and the incredible, dedicated, hardworking and inspiring unpaid staff of Drama Therapy Review who work in putting out two issues a year. It's just a tremendous labor of love and a lot of work um, uh, that that, that is involved in putting this out. And again, very honored that I was able to work with them for this one particular issue. This is a very special issue. It's a great educational issue for students, for researchers, and for training purposes. And it really reveals a rich history of drama therapy. In fact, one of the articles takes us back to the 1970s and the work that was being done early um, by, by a lot of the you know, folks who were founding members of drama uh, NADTA as well too. We also have Chris Myers, uh, who will be uh, speaking uh, a little bit today also about the work that the, the editorial uh, staff of the Drama Therapy Review present. Uh, I'm gonna start with a brief PowerPoint presentation just to go over the issue to give you a sense of uh, the articles that are in there. So let me go ahead and start with that first. And this is again um, a presentation. So this the, the, this artwork on this PowerPoint is all done by Akila, uh, who is also the uh, you know works on the staff of the Drama Therapy Review, and uh, she posted these on Facebook, and I collected them over a period of several weeks, and I just like to go over them with you. So here's a the uh, cover of the issue. Uh, what the, one of our, the first article in the issue is an article by Zaina Dakash. It's called The Blue House, an analysis of the production of Johar Up in the Air. Uh, and I'll have a few more things to say about that. Zaina was unable to be with us today. However, she, I'm going to play a little trailer um, uh, on, on, the, on the article and as well uh, to just uh, explain a little bit about the article as well too. Um, the next article in the in the issue is the one that Elizabeth and I wrote called Narodrama Intersectionality and Devised Therapeutic Theater in the Prison Communication Studies Classroom. The one, uh, now this, this is not in the order in which they appear, but also in more in the order in which they'll be speaking uh, at, today at, during the session. Um, the next one is by Rowena Tam. Uh, entitled Drama Therapy Behind Bars, the site-specific exhibition. The next article will be Drama Therapy and Complex Collective Trauma by Shabrea Alston. Next is an article by Soraya, Susanna Keating, Lynn baker Nauman, and Marianne Schein called The Healing Art of Performing and Witnessing Shakespeare. Transferring Drama Therapy Skills to the Theater Classroom, Inside, Prison, and Beyond. Next is a uh, clinical commentary by Mallory Minerson called Reflections on Action and Intervention Triptych. 
We also have a couple of interviews that were done through the drama therapy collection in prison, drama therapy in prison collection that also appeared in, in this issue of the paper. One is by an interview that Lynn Baker Nauman did with Rodessa Jones. Um, and, and Lynn is here to talk about that later in the session. And the other one is by Marianne Schein with Juan Carlos Mesa. And Marianne is also here and she'll be discussing that later in the session today. We have several book reviews that appeared in this issue. There's actually more book reviews, but I'm only, only mentioning the ones that have to do with incarceration and the, the tremendous global outreach in terms of outpouring, in terms of the work that's being done with prison theater and uh, performances with the criminal justice system. So this one here is a review by Lynn Baker Nauman on a book by Ashley Lucas, uh, Prison Theater and the Global Crisis of Incarceration. We also have a review by Mary Morris on another book called Performing Arts in Prisons, Creative Perspective, Michael Balfour, uh, yeah, Creative Perspectives. And then um, I also there's also an article in here, a review of a collection, online collection of at this point, uh, approximately 15 hours of interviews uh, that are both YouTube videos and podcasts um, that basically give you an overview of both a combination of interviews with drama therapists dating back, as I mentioned, to early 1970s. Here's an interview in here, for example, with Linda Cook, with John Bergman, with Armand Volkos, but also interviews with formerly incarcerated people who who benefited from work doing drama therapy and performance work inside prison and who are now out and continuing some of that work as well too. Um, and then we also have an art, uh, uh, today we're very fortunate to also have Barbara Bornman with us. And so uh, her article appeared in the subsequent issue in Drama Therapy Review issue number 8.2. And so she's here with us and she's also going to be presenting on her essay research work called Drama Therapy, Family Mask Protocol in Forensic Settings, Participant and Therapist Experience. And uh, Barbara has already submitted both the presentation and she's here also in person as well. So that is an overview of the issue. And I just wanted to, uh, after that, just turn it over to Christine and Christine Myers to have her speak uh, uh, for a few minutes about the work of putting out the, the issue as well. Too. Thanks so much, Cameron. Uh, I'm Christine Mayer, and I'm the Associate Editor of Drama Therapy Review, or DTR. So many of you may know DTR. We are the official peer-reviewed journal, academic journal for uh, the North American Drama Therapy Association. And the way that our structure works at DTR is every year we have one general issue that uh, the call for papers is due in February, and then we'll have one special issue every year uh, where the call for papers is August 1st. And we do this for two different reasons. The first one is that we um, want to be able to politically pass the mic to other guest editors who have areas of expertise, knowledge, and also so that we are not controlling um, what papers get published for the organization, but instead are, are sort of providing a space for there to be collections of special issues to be um, pulled together, curated, and become a living archive for our community. And the second reason is because we want to be increasing the number of people who have peer review skills, editing skills, uh, publishing skills within our community because we're such a small crew. And so at DTR, unlike other academic uh, journals, when we are working with special issues or special editors, we're providing a lot of the background support and logistical support to try to help the issue be as successful as possible. So uh, to give you a little bit of a history of how this issue started to come together, Cameron and I were, were jamming about some other issues. We have a, a, you know, a mutual interest um, and love for prison education and ensuring folks that have been disappeared intentionally for racist reasons, for genocidal reasons uh, into prisons, in particular Black and Indigenous populations, uh, that there is access to education, access to healing, access to justice work happening inside bars, as well as after uh, they're released. And so Cameron and I had been talking about some of these issues and uh, 
he asked or they asked whether or not it would be possible to do a special issue. And so when folks sort of reach out to us, uh, we'll, we will walk them through the process of getting another editor involved so that some of the labor is shared, helping them uh, figure out what a call for papers looks like and starting to generate some interest around who potential authors might be, starting to reach out to show that there are enough people who are doing this work interested in writing about the work that they're doing for the special issue to be able to have legs. So if you're ever sitting wondering, why don't we have a special issue on this and you're interested, reach out to us at DTR and we would be happy to help you uh, think that through. The other way that we decide for special issues is we put out a call to the membership a couple times a year, or not a couple times a year, every few years to see what there is interest in. For example, uh, uh, in a most recent one, there was an interest in us having a special issue around specifically decolonial practices and anti-racist practices that are centering the voice of Black, Indigenous, and racialized folks. And that issue is soon to come out uh, at the helm, Britton Williams and Rafilawe Lapere. Um, and this summer, we'll be collecting new articles on disability justice. Um, and the other piece that I'll just sort of say is, uh, if you're interested in getting involved with publishing, uh, we are happy to provide mentorship on that front. If you're interested in peer reviewing for the first time, we can provide mentorship on that front. And then if you're also interested in doing some editing work, um, we will offer some mentorship on that front. And that's, I think, all I need to say at this point, other than thank you to Elizabeth and Cameron for putting together such a special, special issue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. It's just amazing working with you during this period, and I hope it will continue as well, too. Um, we're going to start first with a discussion, brief discussion of Zaina Dakash's work. Zaina Dakash has been a drama therapist in Lebanon, working for the, at least the last 15 years, putting out three award-winning documentaries on working with incarcerated populations. These are full featured documentaries that she did. And this last one that is now actually going to you know, various film festivals is called The Blue, the Blue Inmates uh, or The Blue House. And it was based on the work that she did with a particular special population uh, that were housed in a different building uh, that she decided to work with. And then she created a collaboration between the, the prisoners that were, <clears throat> that were in this building, especially for mental illness, uh, and were basically sentenced to life without a possibility of parole because they were basically told that that they will be released upon being cured. And there was no such thing as you know, defining what cure is. So her work involved not only getting the prison population from the main prison to, in, to engage in collaborative, compassionate work with this other special population, but to also do legislative work that would help reform some of the laws in Lebanon about the way in which they define mental illness as well too. So I'm going to just play the trailer for that documentary. It's a very beautiful, powerful uh, trailer. And then <clears throat> we'll, we'll come back and you know, follow with some other material. Again, so there's an article in the journal about the process of production. And the article is, if I remember, is entitled Blue House and the analysis of the production of Johar up in the air. But let's just watch the video together. يا يما لو جاني العيد يما يا يا يما واني بالبيت الازرق هاي نيويورك لبنان بيروت نايرة خبيلو مدينة عفاضي ما أنا هون ببيت الازرق رومي صارني من حمس خمسة وثمانين سنة بعرف انه اكثريتكم هون اخذين احكام مكتوب فيها لحين الشفاء ما عجبتنيش لحين الشفاء لانه وين هامر ايه بالدس بالمسرحيه مفروض نذكر المرضى النفسيه القاعدين تحت انتوا اللي بنص دين عذابكم قدرتوا تاخذوا بعد مسافه وعن جد فكروا بناس ثانيه محكومين هون وكانه مؤبد عم ياخذوا ادوارنا؟ ايوه مين اخذ دوري؟ من هنا من هنا. You, you need to breathe. You. 
شايفك 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 عم بيقولوا عنه مجنون يعني تصور يكون نايم مثلا بيجي واحد بسط المي هو نايم بتروح بسط المي عذرا ايها القانون عذرا تقول عني مجنون معتوه وممسوس تنتظرني كي اشفى فهل في كتب القانون يا عجيبه زوادي اذا حكموك وقالوا لك رح تبقى بالحبس لحين الشفاء وبلكم ما تفيد بضل Okay, so that was the, the trailer for Zainal Dakasha's article, and I again hope that you will get a chance to read it and also watch the entire uh, feature. It should be made available sometime later this year in the US as well. Next, uh, I will uh, show you a, a videotape, recorded, pre recorded video by Elizabeth Malone Altit, my co uh, guest editor and co author of the article uh, that appeared in the journal. Elizabeth and working in Lancaster prison for since 2017. At first we were working in different parts of the prison and then uh, she came in and started working with, she'll explain the framing of the work that we did. And after uh, this, her video, I will discuss a little bit more. I'll go into some of the other work that I do there as a faculty member teaching uh, communication studies classes. Good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth Malone Altid. I am a registered drama therapist working in Orange County, California, and I am one of the um, special guest co-editors for this issue. I'm sorry I could not be there on Zoom today. I would just like to share a little bit about the process of guest editing as well as our article. So the process for guest editing started with Cameron reaching out to me, Dr. Afari, um, asking if we, I was interested. We had worked together in the Lancaster State Prison for a couple of years, uh, creating devised performance pieces. And we're both very passionate about um, drama therapy in carceral settings and um, all of the work that can go on there, as well as the identities that we have inside, the identities of the participants. Um, and Cameron was a professor um, with Cal State LA inside, and I was doing teaching artist work at the same prison. And so it really worked out that we could work together. And so in terms of the guest co-editing, if any of you are ever interested in doing it in the future, I definitely came from a place of immense learning. I, um, after meeting with the editors and with Cameron several times, we started the process of gathering ideas and articles, reaching out to people. And really they took us step by step through it and made it a very um, cohesive and, um, I wouldn't say an easy process, but the organizational aspect was very easy. Everybody was very supportive and it was a huge learning experience for me. I am now also pursuing my master's in social work and recently taking a research class. And I thought, oh, I learned all of this for a lot of it um, through this process. So I am grateful for it. And um, if anyone's interested in that, um, the Drama Therapy Review, it's an excellent place to learn. So as far as our article goes, we looked at devised um, theater in the Lancaster State Prison, as well as the classroom work that Dr. Afari was doing with his incarcerated students, and um, the work of intersectionality and also narrow drama. So I came in as a theater artist um, with a drama therapy background, and we created two performance pieces, one called Imagine That and another called A Fresh. Imagine That came from the student 
writing reflection papers about a documentary that had been created about one of their peers who was incarcerated but going to school at Cal State LA, who has a daughter who is attending the Cal State LA campus in Los Angeles. And they made this mini documentary. The students wrote a response paper to it. And Cameron had sent me those responses in preparation for um, our theater workshop, um, our acting workshop, really. And in that, I saw so many profound messages being sent about family and the nature of communication on the inside and the outside. And this theme of imagine that, imagine us as sons, grandfathers, fathers, brothers, um, more than who they, you know, more than a number. And I took those responses and I highlighted everything that was just really stood alone, kind of very powerful um, words that they wrote. And we created a script from it. And we performed it at an opening ceremony for the Cal State LA year inside the prison. But getting a little ahead of myself, after the success of that performance, which also included them having this 11 minute performance piece, that they could use anytime they had visitors that came inside their classroom. So for example, they had a woman who was coming into their classroom from a restorative justice program. Um, her son had been murdered and she wanted to go inside a prison and kind of bridge that gap in her mind um, of victim, victimizer, things like that. Um, and they said, you know, you want to know who we are? We have this performance piece. And that was one powerful way in which they used it. So after that success of performing it in front of the Cal State LA trustee and these visitors, they said, we want more. We want to create more. So we got together with them and we went through um, using the Nara drama nine steps um, and the drama therapy core processes, we created another performance called a, um, a Fresh Start. And because it was going to be performed for this Cal State LA ceremony, we decided on the theme of their education, their journeys in education over the years. And we created scenes about from kindergarten all the way up to being an incarcerated college student. Um, and a couple of stories that came out of that. One of the participants, his sister saw the show. He had not been in touch with his son since he was two years old. And she, once they, you know, were able to put the link on YouTube of the performance, um, she was accessed it and showed it to his son. And he said, I want to meet my father. And so it was this catalyst for their relationship, um, kind of rekindling and restarting. And since then, he did get to meet him on Father's Day, and they have an ongoing relationship. Um, another student wrote powerfully about his experience as a kindergartner and having witnessed his father overdosed and then going to school and his teacher um, you know, pinning a note to his shirt saying, you can't, you know, I can't read and wanting his mom to help him read. And his mom took him to the school the next day and said, he can read, but this is what's actually happening to him. And then fast forward to his experience as an incarcerated student, he wrote a letter to his childhood self showing him what he's capable of. And so through going through these narrow drama nine steps and creating, you know, as inspiration and then using the drama therapy processes. We created these two performance pieces that have carried on. And um, I'm sure Dr. Afari will also share more about what the students um, have accomplished since then and what they're doing with theater, with drama therapy. And so that's my little spiel on that. But um, thank you for being a part of this um, workshop and this health lab. And I wish you well. Thanks. Great. So just to, as a follow-up with, with you know, what Elizabeth said, so this is, the work that we do is part of a uh, really building on the shoulders of about a decade of uh, empowering negotiation that some of the incarcerated folks in the prison had already worked on to bring, to make, to make the uh, prison um, um, uh, warden and you know the California Department of Corrections to allow them to bring in uh, training programs. Uh, so we went in there uh, as the offering a bachelor's degree program. It's a long story. The point was that the classes that we were offering these were classes in communication studies, 
They were being trained to become facilitators, educators, to really help change the, some of the culture of the prison uh, inside. So, so I, you know, they were reading chapters from approaches to drama therapy. They were reading about intersectionality. They were reading material about you know engaging, so writing papers, taking classes in interpersonal communication. But we wanted to make sure that those are not just left at the level of them just reading and writing papers, but to actually practice, do some sessions uh, that would not be therapy, name called therapy. We have to make very clear that this is education and not therapeutic, but that it would help them develop their own workshop. So they would they, they developed a workshop called Masks of Masculinity during that period. Um, they were writing papers and then some of the papers were being uh, shared with the students on campus who created animation documentaries. They published journals. They, they, they incorporated some of these writings uh, on drama therapy into their, their work as well too. So that, I just wanted to add that because there's a really important dimension of the article that, I, that we discuss about intersectionality, about silencing and erasure of identities at the intersections of these you know, various multiple ways, you know, oppressive norms that we have. And for them, for the students to really gain both a theoretical insight and practical ways in which they could express themselves in a, in a way that would be helpful to them, both trying to get them out of prison, but also you know, changing their lives inside prison as well too. And I just wanna say that quite a few of these people were, these men that I worked with were, uh, had sentences of life without a possibility of parole. Few of them are out now, they're flourishing, they're doing a lot of good work, including advocacy, working with Human Rights Watch, uh, a couple of them are getting their master's degrees. A few of them are, you know, engaged in uh, training, further training in drama therapy as well. I will, I'll stop because there's so much more to say, but I invite you to, if you'd like to, you know, first of all, read the article in the in the journal, but then also please reach out to me if you'd like to hear more about this process as well. Next, I'd like to invite Lovana Tam, who's here to uh, speak about her work and um I think Rowena also has a PowerPoint that she'd like to share as well too. So we'll, we'll just hand it over to Rowena Tam. Thank you, Cameron. Um, hi, everyone. Can, we can hear me, right? <laughs> okay, lovely. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rowena. I'm based in um, Dajavi, Montreal, although I'm currently in Tokorano slash Toronto. Um, I want to go really quick because we you know we've got so many incredible speakers. I just want to firsthand say thank you to the co-editors as well as the Drama Therapy Review folks who have been so supportive throughout this journey um, with this photo essay. So I think this was one of maybe the first photo essay and it was a really unique experience um, because there was just so much content in terms of imagery that I was able to provide. So I wrote about doing drama therapy in a um, prison within Quebec during an internship while I was doing my master's um, a few years back now. And I realized how powerful it was to do something called response art. And some of you may know this, some of you may not. Um, it's an art therapy practice by Bar uh, coined by Barbara Fish that really looks at how we as clinicians can kind of process and further our internal work, the kind of transference, the client therapist relationship by doing art making ourselves. And so I'm going to see, let's see, can I, there we go. I'm going to show some pictures of what pieces I created. And so I don't know if I already mentioned, but this was a, um, this was a women's prison that was situated um, inside um, the province of Quebec in Canada. And I work with women from all levels of security, so maximum, medium, as well as minimum, and those on remand. And so in order to really look at what I was thinking about, what, I, what was happening within me, I suddenly started just autopilot creating these pieces, such as what we're seeing in front right now. So this piece of response art um, was a really meaningful relationship with myself. There are, so there are two portraits that are of me, the one on the left and the one in the center. It was how I saw myself. And then the third, funny enough, you know, in from beginning to middle to end, I realized like I didn't want to do a portrait of me anymore. 
suddenly I saw myself paralleling the growth of those of my clients. And so this was a portrait of my client, the last one um, on the right here. And it was so, it was so vulnerable to be able to use soft pastels and to just create and think about what kind of movement and material and texture I wanted to bring to honor them as well as me and the experiences that were taking place over the course of these eight months. And I actually, I think they're dried now, but there were, there were tear stains on some of these pieces because I was creating while also thinking about them and allowing myself to just experience what that was like. And I was swelled with these feelings of pride and tenderness and loss. And so this is another piece that emerged um, for those who do may or may not know um, 60% of those who are incarcerated are Indigenous, so First Nations, Métis, and Inuit here in Canada. And I was floored because they only represent 5% of the entire um, country's population. And so one night I came home and I went to shower after having an entire day at the prison. And I thought, how many Jane Doe's are currently isolated behind these prison walls? How many families and community members do not know that they're here? And I wrote and I just took red paint and I slathered this in capital letters on my shower curtain, are all of our missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in prison? And you can see how the reason I situated this moment and this entire exhibition really within my home is because I was able to deface it. I was able to use these nooks and crannies and sit with it. it. Made me realize that even when I went home and left the prison world, I was still encapsulated within it and it stayed with me. And so I kept asking these questions and I realized that most of my clients were indigenous, not just because of the over incarceration. And I wondered, does it have to do with being Asian? Is it what I look like? Some questioned what my identity was and thought that I too was Indigenous and I had to correct them. And then it asked me, and then I kept asking myself, like, what resources are in place? And there aren't many, <laughs> especially in um, Quebec where it is French speaking and there are a lot of English speaking Indigenous folks. So there were so many issues that just came to light and it, you just couldn't unsee them. And this is my living room wall where, you know, in my former home, this was my living room wall. And I just kept seeing all these twists and turns and overlapping strings and ropes and layers of issues and entanglement. And you can see it yourself in this piece that's called Fight, Flight, Freeze and was used as the DTR Journal's um, cover page, which was an honor. There's so much interlocking, there's wings of flutter, there's corporal energy, there's fluctuation. There's intention and sharpness and softness, mobilization, staying, sedentary, protection, haste. And all these words that come up to mind, I just had to throw it up onto my wall. And so every night I'd come home and I would add to it. I would add, I would cut up these little fruit, fruit bags that I had. I would use the string that I found both in the prison and in my home on the street. Some things I picked up on the ride home in the metro what else could I add? And so it wasn't just an exhibition. I also had a performance. And this is an image of me after being, um, after engaging in performance art with an audience member. So community members, friends, clinicians, professors, they were all invited to my home. And that was a really, really raw moment to invite people who you see on a collegial, professional, or, and sometimes personal level, um, within a space where you completely externalized everything that you internally felt. What was that like? It was scary. I, I can, as someone who has done performances over and over again, I would say this was my most, um, the performance that I was most worried about because I realized I wasn't putting on a performance as someone, I was performing as me. But I did it. <laughs> and so what I used for the audience, what I used in this piece to showcase to the audience was what my routine was like, how home was like for me and how home almost became a prison space, an extension of it, and how I felt um, what I needed to do to belong. 
this is an image um, of my bedroom, actually. And you can see how I turned this entire corner of one part into an audience engagement space. So there are materials everywhere. Audience members were allowed to go and just sit and touch and pick up whatever materials they had. It's a little hidden, but that entire shelf was full of materials for them, similar to how I would present it when I was in a client um, session. And there's another photo here that kind of exemplifies this. And after the performance, some people came up to me and they were like in tears or filled with gratitude and just experiencing a lot of abundance of emotions and pride and raw inner contention of witnessing how I put myself into such a vulnerable place that they felt that they wanted to as well. There were so many conversations of vulnerability. There were so many conversations about personal struggles. And I was so surprised to hear, and it was actually an, a huge impetus for the project too, how people felt they wanted to do something. They were like, this is horrible. And they learned through just witnessing whatever creations are in front of you right now in this art, um, in this artistic sphere. They had no idea that any of this existed and to have a first-hand experience made through art making was a really powerful tool. Fellow therapists also commented not being able to imagine what working as a drama therapist in prison would look like, especially when it comes to working with in incarcerated Indigenous women. Like we talk about intersectionality and the different experiences um, that are present there and the lack of research, right? So when I was a student, I was like, I am not equipped or I don't feel like I am because nothing even speaks to what we are trying to do now. But years ago, I remember thinking, we barely write it or acknowledge the existence of Indigenous people within drama therapy, much less in prison. Like, there's so many things to be said about that. Excuse me. So the educational discourse came in, and that was incredible, really lovely. And I'm sort of wrapping up here now. This is a piece that says, I hope I do not see you here again. And it's inspired by the thank you, have a great day, little like, plastic bags that you see when you go to the convenience store. This is a bag that's actually used and was taken from prison. And that's what they store all your artwork in where I worked. So as clients left, they received this paper bag and they would stand outside of the bus shelter with it. And it had everything that they ever came with, everything that they worked with. And when I left, I took the same bag and I exited it just like them, took all my materials and I went home. And I really thought to myself, you know, I really hope I don't see you here again. And not for them, but for me, and also the existence of prisons in general. It was like so multifaceted and layered. And it made me think a lot about how do we advocate for the abolition of prisons within the prison milieu. And so now it's been over three years since this internship, since this exhibition, since this performance, and my understanding of prison abolition has con continued to expand and be nourished and, and titrate between what does anti-carceral tenets of thought and philosophies look like? How can we integrate it into drama therapy? What do we do as drama therapists working within carceral institutions, knowing that this isn't the, <laughs> an effective method for justice? It's not an effective method for safety, well-being, and belonging. And I continue to question these my, for myself and something I'm exploring my doctoral research as I now look at um, how can we serve incarcerated racialized women. We still don't have the research and yet we still put drama therapists in these spaces. I learned how to look inward, how to look outward, knowing that surveillance and control is rampant. I wanted to find response art as a tool to self-express and to continue to learn and make these critiques for ourselves within this domain, within the exterior, and allow ourselves to let others know too, to infiltrate this knowledge because so much of it is secretive, especially, I, I'm not sure about with other places, but especially in Canada, you can't talk about anything that happens. And so what's that like on top of, you know, the confidentiality layer and then you know, the other um, 
the other moments where you're worried that perhaps it might be subpoenaed. So there are so many different layers of working as a trauma therapist um, in prison that we still haven't um, discussed a lot about. And so this is a learning opportunity. And I love this image. It speaks to liberation. It speaks to my time that was there during a moment of contention. It speaks to me um, being at a point where I was finding myself and finding myself as a therapist and finding myself um, as a therapist who was working in a prison yet in support of prison abolition. It was a very conflicting time. And now I can recognize that we need to continue to imagine what a world can look like beyond the prison industrial complex. And I'll leave you with that. And I'll leave you with these images. And I thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Rowena. It's great to hear you speak about it, uh, the article as well, too. It's really wonderful. Next, we have Shabreya Alston's uh, piece. Her, her, her work was entitled, it was a case a study was called uh, Drama Therapy and Complex Collective Trauma. Hi, my name is Shabria Alston, and I recently wrote for the Drama Therapy Review. My commentary, Drama Therapy and Complex Collective Trauma, focuses on drama therapy work with adolescent youth and juvenile detention with criminal charges. It's based off of Armand Volkus's um, Healing the Wounds of History Drama Therapy Theory method. So with that, I introduced the term complex collective trauma, and it's described as an experience impacted by several different uncontrollable yet interconnected events that are carried in our psyches in various forms. So these uncontrollable and interconnected events develop into a collective narrative that influences cultural and national identities of a group or an individual. So during my time as a residential clinician during the past few years, the global pandemic began, the Black Lives Matter movement heightened, and the 2020 presidential race and election really informed changes in protocol, connection, and conversation. Um, and so the effects of complex collective trauma experiences and just like collective trauma experiences um, definitely increased the complications of daily management and functioning um, for the youth that I was working with and for my entire team. And then other forms of grief that I included um, or identified include the loss of in-person and family connection, the loss of physical touch, the loss of structure and routine, the loss of physical activity within a group, and being confined to a small room for a 14-day quarantine period. Um, so during that time, some of the major like notable state of emergency changes on the unit were um, the youth court hearings were um, put on hold and we were in contact with attorneys very, like, daily, multiple times a day. Um, there was a mask mandate, daily temperature checks, screenings um, to be completed every morning before entering the building, virtual visits um, were mandated, like, on the unit iPad, and family events, school and clinical groups were canceled until further notice, and then contact between the clinicians and youth was limited to as needed. Um, so as I began to like um, get into work trying to just reintroduce creativity, reintroduce some form of structure or something, um, I came across the HWH process, um, which has five goals. So okay. recognizing and deconstructing yep. cultural or national identity, intercultural conflict resolution, and teaching intercultural communication helping participants move deeply into and experience their personal and collective grief and mourning, and to create a culture of empathy, and then to create meaning out of suffering. And so when we apply these to complex collective trauma, these goals help me to create a basis for processing the various forms of grief and loss, and to create and encourage empathy amongst the youth and staff, to deconstruct and reconstruct cultural identity in a setting that can feel so dehumanizing to some youth and even staff. Um, we explored meaning and purpose in the process of suffering and modeling and teaching conflict resolution and communication individually and within the group. Um, so for me, this was a very cathartic experience of working with just a group of young Black men and working with them to explore their emotions, communicate their innermost thoughts and feelings, and just partaking in healthy emotional expression. 
Um, I think the method worked because it did provide a lot, like structure when there wasn't structure and structure when rebuilding and regaining. Um, of course, there were issues with resistance, but I really utilized like improv games. I really pushed staff to show up more empathetically um, and to play as well, which also helped the youth that were resistant to want to join. Um, we did a lot of like writing, script writing, providing ideas and things like that. So throughout this process, um, there was a there was a lot of room for grieving and mourning, but also right, how do we heal or show, you know, that we are healing in this. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me at shabriaolston at gmail.com. And thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, Shabray Alston, for your wonderful presentation on your clinical commentary. We're now moving to the next uh, uh, recording, but the presenters are also all here as well, too. But they did submit a 15 minute recording. This is on the healing art of performing and witnessing Shakespeare, transferring drama therapy skills to the theater classroom inside prison and beyond. Hello, welcome. This discussion will be about the Drama Therapy Review article in the special issue 8.1. The title of our article is The Healing Art of Performing and Witnessing Shakespeare, Transferring, Transferring Drama Therapy Skills to the Theater Classroom Inside Prison and Beyond. And I am Marianne Schein. And I'm Lynn Baker Nauman one of the co-writers of this article. And we would like to thank Cameron Afari and Elizabeth I'll teach for their help, their beautiful editing, and all the work they did on this process. It was a really rich experience for us. Thank you, Lynn. And, and I'm Soraya Keating, another co-writer of this article. And it's really good to be here with you, Marianne and Lynn, and with our, our listeners. And today in this short video, we would love to do the following. Uh, first, we, we'd love to talk about what inspired us to write this article. Uh, second, we'll, we'll talk about why this article is important to us and also some highlights of what the article is about. And finally, we'll share some examples of what's in the article and um, the crew method in particular and why, why we feel it's important. So to get started, I'd like to throw it out to you, Lynn and Marianne. What made you want to write this article? Ah, I will begin. I think the opportunity to, to work with Soraya and Marianne, um, you know, two women that I love working with for years, um, alongside and from sometimes afar, but um, to write about a process that was so meaningful to all of us um, was really exciting. And to hone in on all of the elements that made the experience for us as drama therapists, like so exciting day by day. And, um, and then, yeah, the the focus in on the specific method methodology um was just super exciting to share so um yeah i think uh writing about shakespeare in prison is um and first of all to do the work is an honor and i love the power of play um and the impact on people who are incarcerated and if we can share what we do inside hopefully that'll um, inspire other people to do the work as well yeah, thank you. I I totally echo what both of you said. And I guess to add to that, um, it seems like there's uh kind of a, a lack of writing about this topic. And and I I have had so many times of being so profoundly touched in this work of bringing Shakespeare to prison and seeing so much magic happen that I wanted to be a part of this trio bringing some of that forward uh, to the public through written form. I was gonna add too of how often people would ask questions in, in regular life about this process and what we do, 
that people would say like, you should write about this. And so it was that exciting part too of going, ooh, this is an opportunity to then share, like you said, with other folks. Yes, agreed. And And for me, something about sitting down to write really um, creates this space to sit back and do deeper reflection on what are we doing? What is actually happening that is creating a uh, healing community and um, so much more, so much growth. So that, that opportunity to, to reflect that comes when one sits down to write and also dialogue with, with you too. So moving into our next question, I'd love to invite you both to share um, why is this article important to you and also what are some of the, the themes in the article or you know, what, what is this article about that you'd like to highlight? Hmm. Yeah. Um, it's really important to for me about the healing power of telling stories, performing stories, um, getting in touch with one's emotions and being able to have a safe place where you can express yourself and to learn how to trust others and create a, a safe container in which to create that sense of play and story. Um, and I think the work that you created, Soraya, because uh, I got to work with you as an intern when I was at CIAS, um, and Lynn was in my cohort, and we got to watch the beautiful work that you had established at um, San Quentin Prison uh, with the Shakespeare program through Marin Shakespeare Company. And then it's expanded through the years to so many other places. But we were working with you, like under your wing from the beginning. And then um, a few years later, I got to run my own classes and direct my own shows. And it's just such an amazing experience to, about, to be able to share it in writing is really important and how healing it is. And we have a lot of um, people who are formerly incarcerated now on the outside, and it's literally changed their lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And to to go with that changing lives, I think for as, you know, that first beginning couple of days of of being under, you know, Soraya's tutelage and then being able to grow as a teaching artist and drama therapist, um, to the fact that how much it changed my life, our lives, you know, to be able to then be a part of that growth and finding that inner growth with like for myself was was really powerful. And so to be able to then um, see that on a daily with the participants, the students that were you know, embracing this and, and that idea that so many never considered themselves an actor or a Shakespearean actor or having any of these, these skills that they worked hard to you know, manifest and work on and, uh, and really invest their time in enthusiasm and that creativity just bubbling over that was really an important process for me hmm. thank you both and and it was such an honor to work with you both uh in the years which we overlapped and uh, i found it such a joy to see you both kind of take flight and establish your own mm -hmm. uh you know, way of doing things and bring your own gifts and leadership skills. And, and, you know, in a larger context, one thing I love about this work is um, kind of like you're pointing to Lynn, it, it gives people in prison an opportunity to really shine their light, to really be leaders, to be seen in ways that um, they're recognize for their gifts their talents their their stories and that to me is a really unique experience in a prison setting when there's so much um oppression and stigmatization and not being seen as human so mm -hmm. that also feels important for me to to name is the the, like the lifting each other up together as we kind of collectively co-create. Um, so we'd love to hear 
as a last part of this discussion, what about CREW, the CREW model? And I'll just say CREW is a, an acronym that stands for some of the key principles that are that are involved in what makes Shakespeare healing in prison. So crew, C being for uh, connection and also community, R being for reflection, E being for expression, emotional expression, could also be for empathy, <laughs> and W for witnessing. So yeah, Lynn, Marianne, would either of you like to give an example? of of those principles and and how they're woven in to a Shakespeare group and and why they're important. Absolutely. Um I love when you talk about connection. I think it's so important, Soraya. Um it it fosters um friendship, giving and receiving, um, our connection to self, our connection to the written text. Um, Shakespeare wrote about such human uh, conditions, and then also connection to our own inner worlds. Um, and we're working in these places that have incredible amounts of trauma, just by virtue of all of these different people coming together in their different backgrounds and how to um, create connection in these places where it's really hard to trust one another and to get a safe um, container. That was another C we could throw in there, container. <laughs> here as a safe container. I was going to uh, reflect on witnessing the idea that they go through, you know, 35 weeks or you know, however many, how, so much time. And some of these folks, you know, struggled through school or didn't ever have that ability to go through and, and commit to something and then have an opportunity to share it with an audience and like be witnessed and be seen and to hear the stories afterwards too of like, oh, the CEO saw it and they were really impressed or or to hear that their family saw on YouTube later or, or these, these elements, their reflection later of the witnessing process. And I think it's that being seen for the first time is something different than the worst day of your life and and being like having that fun joy and so i think it's just the the excitement of the being witnessed and the validation and just everybody seems like on a different level the day of performance you know and then we're reflecting back the like the following week you know so that was something i really you know held dear to Mm, mm. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, just such powerful, simple medicine that that witnessing and that um, connection that we all need as humans. And Marianne, you, you pulled in the trauma piece. And that's so important for for healing trauma is um, is that ability to connect in a vulnerable, alive, loving way with ourselves and others. And to me, that's a huge part of what programs like a Shakespeare program when held in a loving container can really, can really provide. Um, and then just to say a little bit about reflection and expression. One thing I love about theater is it gives us the opportunity to to um, to take on roles and express emotions that we might not otherwise do in our in our regular life that we might from our conditioning or or what have you kind of suppress things or have things come out in unhealthy ways. So theater gives us the power to to be free inside, to express and to learn more about ourselves in that way. And then to reflect, like push the pause button, which is sometimes hard to do in life, but there's like a natural pause button when we're working on a play where we talk about what's going on with the character, what's going on with ourselves. So um, to me, those are um, also essential parts of what makes what makes Shakespeare in particular really powerful. Um, 
So anything you would like to say in conclusion, Marianne, Lynn? Yeah, read the article. We go further in depth. In fact, we felt like we could write a book. We had so many, <laughs> so many stories, so many examples, um, and we really had to cut it down. So you got the core juicy bits in the article. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. I and look out for too. our book one day yes. soon. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and perhaps I'll just sprinkle in, um, because this does feel important, you know, why Shakespeare, well, uh, you know, Shakespeare is a, a beautiful example of a distanced form of, of drama therapy, and that we're, we're, we're using an imaginary world to open up an inner space in ourselves to reflect on our lives and the world. Um, but it, it's like through the back door, which can really lower defenses and uh, open up a field of play in a beautiful mm -hmm. way. So wanted to share that as well. So important. I'm really glad you brought that in. It's in my notes. And I went right past it. That's so <laughs> good. Yeah. <laughs> that's why we need each other. Yeah. Yes. That's why there's three of us. You that's to work right. together. <laughs> got it. And Thank all you. of you listening. Um, <laughs> Yes. Well, thank you all for being here to watch us. And thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Soraya, Lynn, and Marianne for your wonderful work. Next, we have a clinical uh, discussion presentation on um, Mallory Minerson's clinical commentary that was entitled Reflections on Action and intervention triptych. Hi, my name is Mallory Minerson, and I am a registered drama therapist in Canada, and I live and work in Inuvik in the Western Arctic uh, as a regional clinical supervisor for the Beaufort Delta region's uh, child and youth mental health team. I'm also an NYU alumni, and I'm really honored to be here today to to talk a little bit about uh, the article that I wrote for the forensic issue of the drama therapy review. I wrote a clinical commentary for this issue of the DTR about my time as an intern while attending NYU. So much of my practice today is informed by my time working in forensics as an intern in New York City, but also um, after graduation, I went on to work in forensic psychiatry uh, back in Canada in Calgary, Alberta. The nature of my commentary is to explore three interventions that I offered on the unit as an intern and to examine why they were effective and appropriate with this population at this time. I currently supervise clinicians who operate both out of the school settings and in community mental health practice. And I think and talk a lot about reflexivity in the work, the ability to respond freely and playful response while being bolstered by the theory and knowledge and practice that's fully integrated into the clinician's toolbox into that embodied sense of knowing. The commentary discusses how I think that this is a unique gift that drama therapists have, that we are able to walk into a group setting with a plan and then also being willing to let it drop away and respond to what's being offered to us today in the moment, in the here and now. I think that this article was important for me to write because as I grow into becoming a, a more experienced, perhaps wiser therapist, I think that there's value in pausing to reflect on the experiences that led me to where I am today. It was, the exploration into designing and running groups and interventions with freedom and feeling that I was trusted to make solid choices helps me also as I remind myself what a gift that was. So that when I'm supervising therapists now, I also remember the impact of that felt trust and how that helped me to make bold choices. So often on inpatient units, um, like standard groups are what is offered and the intern clinician might adapt the standard offering to their own style. In this setting, I was given the freedom to run groups that evolved out of what was coming up on the unit, in the unit group dynamic, and as a response to the individual patients that were currently admitted. The subtle, more nuanced skills that I learned in forensics around de-escalation, attunement in the milieu, and uh, the, the lessons around grappling with my own power and privilege 
and of many other opportunities to grow and explore the kind of clinician that I wanted to be. I am ever grateful to the patients that I had the privilege of offering services to during this time, as well as to my colleagues and our fearless supervisor, Danny Haywood, for his exceptional guidance. Um, I apologize for not being able to be there live uh, with time zones today in person, and especially for missing the rich discussion that I know that you're going to have. Um, I just want to say thank you to the DTR team and to Cameron and Elizabeth for the invitation, as well as to NYU for hosting this event every year. It's so awesome. And I hope that you enjoy the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Mallory Minerson. And we have one more presentation. We have actually two more, but we're only going to be playing one of them. And this one is Barbara Bornman's Drama Therapy Family Mask Protocol in a Forensic Setting Participant and Therapist Experience. This was actually published in the subsequent issue of Drama Therapy Review in 8.2. We're very happy to also incorporate it today in the presentation. And Barbara has created a recorded, pre-recorded PowerPoint presentation that I'll be showing next. Hello, I'm Barbara Bornman, drama therapist, licensed creative arts therapist. I work with correctional health services in a forensic setting in New York City. I'm going to be presenting a drama therapy family mask protocol that's published as a clinical commentary in the 8.2 issue of Drama Therapy Review. I'm also presenting the participants' masks that are published in an art catalog. It was during COVID when I approached an individual who's diagnosed with trauma to see if he wanted to make masks to represent his family members and then use role play to explore the family story. This protocol has four steps, mask making, intermingling, which is a step that our participant created, the participant drama and participant reflections. I also include my autoethnographic response. Masks as a projective technique may offer a greater sense of psychological security to an individual who is experiencing trauma, especially in a setting where vulnerability is not outwardly shown. He chose to make the feminine masks first, the mother and the sister. He had an image that he was working with. His relational style was very warm and intimate. Uh, he was engaged in spontaneous play and embodied his inner feminine as he took a paintbrush and um, painted his own face. You can see through the um, caterpillar barrette, he was really adorning the mother mask. And um, it was during this phase of the, the mask making where the family trauma unfolded, particularly with the sister mask. He, when he started the, the father mask, he, his presentation really changed. He was irritable, he was angry, we had to process his anger. At one point, he enacted destroying the father and was reminded that this was his play space. He creates his mask of self as two-dimensional and unadorned. He describes himself as a blotched landscape, still trying to form and connect. Once the masks were completed, he said he wanted to intermingle. Um, so driven by self-determination, he wanted to do this intermingling where he would be addressing each mask individually. Um, reportedly, to have control over the family members as well as um, control over the childhood trauma. Uh, this gave him the opportunity to create the aesthetic distance needed between himself and his family to assert control as the only living family member. It was during this step of the protocol that he enacted forgiving the father. And this was an important action that helped him change the family trauma into a reparative family drama. 
he became very curious about who his father was as a young, a young boy um, running free on a native reservation. He wanted to know um, what happened when his father was drafted into the military and sent to Germany and met his mother. He wanted to know if in a family council, when they were children, could the father be changed from a devil into a loving parent? And these questions um, were turned into scenes that were enacted with the masks. The participants' effort to work through his resistance to creating the family drama was applauded with good effect. He began this process with self-imposed limitations um, on doing drama therapy and became grateful for creating this new perspective on his family. He reported that he can no longer use the family as an excuse because they are deceased and indicated that the masks gave him the power to see the real demon himself. And now he could own that part of himself and grow. Through the reparative family drama, the participant recreated his family's past and now had a transformed representation of his family story. He stated that this was the greatest gift he has ever received and was reminded that this was a gift that he gave to himself. Here's my clinical mask. I am a white woman of privilege. I am creative by nature and nurture. I am both educated and dedicated to working with people in the forensic population. Uh, I was very moved by doing this work. And um, as the archetypes were uncovered in the mask making and the family story unfolded, I was not prepared to hear the depth of the childhood abuse reported. I did at one point reach out to my therapist. My emotional response is um, captured in the following watercolor drawing. Um, this is what I call the upside down heart in the thicket. The thicket being the part of the forest that's impenetrable. And the thicket represents um, the impact of incarceration, intergenerational trauma and familial trauma, all of which is holding this heart upside down. Ultimately, I was inspired by the integrity of this participant, of his courage um, to face the family trauma and courage to face himself. I was impressed with his ability to create intermingling this step in the protocol that helped him change the family story from one of war winning over love to one where love wins over war. Thank you. I'm just going to turn it over to Danielle. Thank you, everyone. I'm glad that we were able to share this with you. Uh, thank you so much, Kamran. I'm going to ask anyone who it is accessible to do so to turn on your camera and just give a round of applause to all of our presenters um, for coming today. Uh, thank you so, so much for your presentation. I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>